The following accounts are based on alleged eyewitness testimony and are presented for entertainment purposes only. These stories are submitted by actual viewers just like you. Therefore, all stories delivered in this video should be taken with a grain of salt. Jay was a young man at the time of this story and was a college student and looking for a place to move into to save money on rent. And as it turns out, moving into his grandmother's old farmhouse was a fantastic option to save money. And beside the amazing financial benefits that moving into this farmhouse would provide Jay, he was excited to immerse himself in his family's history because it was once his grandmother's. And speaking of his grandmother, she had lived on this same farm for roughly 50 years or so until she passed away and it's pretty much just been sitting vacant in the time being. As time has gone on since her passing, Jay had heard things about strange rumors and supernatural things going on at the farm, but he just assumed it was all superstition and clearly wrote it off, moving happily into this farm to save money and to enjoy the solace and peace that this beautiful land would provide him. The farm in question was located in New South Wales, Australia. It was beautiful, so serene, rolling green hills, towering tall trees. It was the perfect place to just go there and just to relax and enjoy the property around you. The house itself was an amazing old structure with the rusty tin roof. The house also featured a sprawling veranda that wrapped around the entirety of the house. And even though the house on the outside and on the inside did show some signs of wear and tear, Overall, it was a great opportunity for Jay. Jay did not move onto this farm by himself because with him, he had brought his Australian Kelpie dog, Artemis, with him, who was extremely loving, very energetic, and extremely protective of him, as well as five chickens for egg production. Now, besides the chickens and the dog and Jay, those were the only living things on this entire property no one else nothing else life on the property at first felt pretty good i mean jay was enjoying taking care of the house and working out in the orange groves and just enjoying a different living style of life and that's when strange unexplainable things began to happen around the farm it all began with noises at the window at nighttime what jay described as a tapping sound at first which he just assumed was from the wind and then he would hear other strange noises like what sounded like somebody walking along the tin roof, which is also very strange because again, he is the only one out here. Other times he would hear these undiscernible noises coming from by the house and further away, but he couldn't exactly make out what they were or who or what they were coming from. Either way, they left Jay incredibly unsettled. All of these things kept happening, but at a slow pace. And then one night, Jay was awoken by Artemis's incessant barking. She was just hysterical about something. So kind of getting up out of a sleepy stupor, he decides to go let her out and humor her as to whatever she's barking and going crazy at. After trying to calm her down and pat her, she clearly was very worked up by something that was outside. So he decided to let her go and follow her. She had ran to the front door, continued to bark and go crazy. So Jay comes up, opens the door, Artemis runs off into the night and Jay's thinking, okay, maybe there's something out there. Maybe there's an intruder. So he goes out there to follow her and she's taking off barking, going crazy. And she stops over by the old rusty shed. Now, Jay, of course, is calling to her. He's going up to her saying, what's going on, girl? Why are you freaking out? And he's looking around, but he doesn't see anything, at least anything out of the ordinary, but she's still going crazy and barking. So he's thinking, all right, whatever. He just tries to calm her down. And he's like, come on, girl, let's go back to the house. At this point, Artemis is still incredibly worked up. She's growling, she's sniffing around, she's acting nervous, her tail is between her legs. This dog can clearly sense that something is wrong. And Jay keeps looking around, but doesn't see anything wrong. So he just decides to try and grab her and go back to the house with her. And as they're making their way back to the front door, Jay hears something. Now, what he hears, he's actually convinced at first that it's in his head, but he notices that Artemis responds to this noise as well. 
And the noise that Jay reports hearing is a sort of faint whisper noise. Now, he didn't discern any words, but it just sounded like a voice he had never heard before. And he realized that as soon as he had heard it, Artemis pays attention to it as well. The whisper grew and crescendoed, growing louder and more intense. And it was then that Jay was able to properly discern that this was not a voice he's ever heard before, nor is it from something he's even familiar with because it sounded as if the noise was coming from all around him and not from one direction like it would be if a person was whispering at you. And as this began happening, he reported this spine chilling feeling of just cold eeriness and malevolence. He described it as a haunting sound, something he did not want to be in the presence of. So he quickly took Artemis, they went back in the house and that was the end of that night. And that particular event sort of seemed like the catalyst for what was to come. Because as soon as that happened, now things within the home started to happen. Like all sorts of strange activity, things being misplaced, things being moved, doors and cabinets being opened. There's times at night where Jay could have sworn that he heard someone very heavy going up and down the hallway. And of course, the entire time, Artemis has her hackles raised, she's looking around, she's freaked out and dogs being dogs, they're much more perceptive to those things than we are. And so she was clearly sensing and feeling nervous about something being in the home. But of course, Jay wasn't sure what. And so there was one day where Jay was with Artemis and they were out working in the field and he was tending the chickens and just enjoying being outside and just trying to get the sense of peace that he's been longing for, but had not been able to quite yet with all these things going on and he sees rustling in the bushes very close by. Thinking it's a large animal, he sees who's ever in the bushes now get up and move quickly behind a tree, and now he's starting to think, okay. But then he sees, to his surprise, that it's actually his Uncle George. Now, his Uncle George had actually just lived right down the road. He was a very kind, very sweet man. And according to Jay, it was very often they would meet up and have coffee or tea and talk about repairing and tuning up classic cars and parrots and just tidbits of casual conversation. Now, after striking up the initial conversation, Jay invited George in to go have some tea. And so they're sitting in the kitchen, just having casual conversation and catching up with each other. When Jay notices that George's eyes keeps darting around the kitchen nervously that Jay could just tell by his body language his demeanor that he was very physically uncomfortable and at one point during their conversation his uncle George just leans in looks right him in the eye and says hey uh you know there's been some really strange things that have happened at this farm things that can't be explained. He simply takes a sip of his tea and continues saying, I've been hearing whispers at nighttime and I've seen things that can't be explained. Of course, Jay isn't going to acknowledge this. He just tells George, it's just superstition. Don't worry about it. There's really nothing going on that can't be explained. But his uncle George persisted, telling Jay that there have been stories that have gone on on this piece of property for generations and generations. Stories of angry spirits, demons, ghosts, and all things that are dark and creep in the night. Now, Jay was not having any of this, and he politely asked his uncle George to please leave. George, trying to be polite, simply honored his request, but before he got up to leave, he turned, looked at Jay and said, please be careful. There are things in this world we don't quite understand. And just like that, he left. Once George had left, this dreadful feeling just kind of settled in all around Jay, a feeling he could not shake. And so he tried to just get rid of it and push it down. And you know what? I'm going to go distract myself. And he went out to go work in the orange groves, hoping to clear his mind and just distract himself. And while he was out there doing whatever it was he was doing, he found himself just unable to properly focus. Like his brain was clouded or something. And he noticed that Artemis was visibly bothered as well. And the entire time she kept barking and growling at the tree line. Of course, Jay would look, but would never see anything. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Jay hears this violent, blood-curdling scream 
coming off in the direction of his house. And he sees that Artemis is already pretty much there, so he drops his tools and whatever he's working on, and he runs all the way back to the front of his house. He gets to the house, sees Artemis going crazy, barking frantically at the front door. So he's thinking that someone's now broken in the house, something is really wrong. He opens the front door, and there, standing in the hallway, is a figure completely shrouded in darkness he couldn't make out any discernible features but immediately he knew deep down in his gut his entire being that the figure he was looking at was not human almost instantaneously this figure diverts its attention away to wherever it was going and immediately starts moving towards Jay. Jay immediately backs away in terror and Artemis, being the protective loving dog she is, actually jumps up and lunges at this figure trying to protect her master only for her jaws to go right through the dark shadowy figure and land on the opposite side. Now, as soon as this happened, this dark figure immediately let out this ungodly scream and instantly dissipated in front of him. This was enough. Jay was done. He quickly grabs his things, packs up what little he has. He calls a friend and says, yo, I need to get out of here. I have had enough. This is too much for me. Hangs up the phone, grabs Artemis, and he's making his way out of the house. And as he exits the house, he can see the figure again standing there on the veranda. And he could sense and see that it was reaching out to him, beckoning him, and he could feel its dark, malevolent energy pulse Sating coming towards him. Him and Artemis make a beeline to the car. They get in, they slam the doors, they lock it, and they're whipping out of there. And they could see that this figure has now left the veranda and is coming down towards the vehicle and is now keeping up with the vehicle. But as he's now making it further and further away from the farm and property, whoever or whatever this figure was begins to just disappear into the darkness. Jay never did return to that farm and he never spoke of what happened to really anyone other than some close family friends. He knew that he had encountered something beyond our basic realm of understanding and comprehension, but what he doesn't know. When Cameron was a teenager, right around 15 years of age, him and his friends were so fascinated with the supernatural and paranormal and UFOs and conspiratorial underground bases that they would sometimes try to venture out and do some urban exploration just to try and experience to get a taste of some of these things. And of course, this was also back in the mid to late 90s, so nobody had smartphones yet and intelligent gadgets that we all use every day were simply not available to the public yet. And so one day during the summer, Cameron and his friends decided they really wanted to experience the supernatural. So they decided they would go to one of the local stores, probably like a supermarket, like a Walmart or something, and they would buy themselves a Ouija board that they could use and try to talk or summon spirits. So they went right home over to Cameron's friend's house. They turned off all the lights. They lit a couple candles. They stood around and they put their hands on the planchet. They began asking it some basic questions and they were a little disappointed. They didn't have this crazy Hollywood-esque experience where spirits are pouring out of the board and everyone's possessed. No, it was underwhelming to say the least. I mean, sure, the plan ship moved around and answered some questions, but nothing major. So they all just said, eh, and continued on doing whatever summer activities they would do and continue to enjoy each other's company. Now, about a week goes by and Cameron is at his house. He's laying down on his bed and it's probably about 8 p.m. give or take. Quick note here is that when you go into Cameron's bedroom, his bed is actually up against the wall. Now on the other side of that wall is the outside of the house. So somebody could come from outside, knock on the window and the window's right there along with the wall, right? That's a pretty standard typical setup. So as he's laying there listening to music and kind of just zoning out, he hears the pitter pattering of feet running towards the house, running up the wall and up on the roof really quick. And he's thinking, what the heck? And he even thought to himself that it sounded like a small child just cause of the little pop, 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 the pitter pattering of feet. Weirded out by this strange experience, he gets up out of bed, goes out to the kitchen where he sees his mom is just casually washing dishes and he's going, hey mom, 
uh, is my stepdad outside working up on the roof? And she looks at him with this very surprised expression and is like, no, no, he's not. And so, of course, at this point, Cameron's like, okay, whatever. And he goes back and lays down. Now, this was just one odd experience. So he eventually forgot about it. It wasn't a big deal. Shortly after that event happened, things started to increase and get worse. And he could recall one specific time that he was lying in his bed, probably getting ready to doze off. Everybody else in the house was asleep in their own respective bedrooms. And instantly, he's lying there and he feels this overwhelming sense of fear in his room. And then he feels this cold air, this, this gust of wind come at him and he could feel something enter into his body. And immediately, he just is overwhelmed by this sense of fear and rage within his body and his eyes begin to roll back in his own head. And this wasn't just a one-time thing. This would actually occur nearly weekly for the entirety that he was in high school with it gradually escalating worse and worse. And as time went on, it went from about once a week to two to three times a week over the course of his four year high school span. And there would be times where it would happen just as I described. He would feel immediate fear in his room, a cold rush of air and something enter into him. His eyes roll back, he feels fear and rage. And then he recounts feeling lifted up into the air as if some natural or supernatural force was pulling him up towards the ceiling. And now his eyes are rolled back, but he claims that he could sense and feel everything, that he, whatever it was had lifted him up so close to the ceiling that his own nose almost touched the tip of the ceiling and then would slowly bring him back down on the bed. And then in another very similar incident, these things were all happening once again. And he recalls gathering up enough energy, even though he was practically paralyzed, to look over to his door and try to just get enough energy so he could just get up out of bed and crawl towards the doorway. And you got to remember, he was practically paralyzed. Whatever had gone inside of him was now controlling him like a puppeteer. He couldn't move. He couldn't laugh. He couldn't cry. He couldn't scream. He could barely even turn his head and his body. And as he's fighting against whatever's controlling him and he's trying to leap off the bed towards the door, he feels himself jump down onto the floor and he starts crawling towards the door. But here's the twist. He looks back at the scene behind him and is horrified the fact that he sees his actual body still there levitating in the air, paralyzed, and he realizes that his own soul, his spirit, is now out of his body. Now, upon realization of this, wham, he sucked back into his body and whatever entity was controlling him vanished and left. These events, unfortunately, were all too common for Cameron. And as horrifying and as terrifying as they were, he basically had to get used to it. In fact, there were other nights where he'd be up late and his parents and family, they'd be out going grocery shopping or running errands. And so he'd be home all alone in the house watching TV or whatnot. And like most houses where you have a living room and a hallway where bedrooms are, he could sometimes hear something turning a doorknob, opening it, turning a doorknob, opening it, and could feel a sinister, dark presence back there. But of course, after going through what he had already gone through, he was not about to go and investigate what was going on. So he would just call his best friend up on the phone and try to distract himself from what was really happening. Something else that Cameron thought was weird is during the course of these four years, when he would lay in his bed sideways with his face facing the wall and his back towards the room and the door, he would report hearing people whispering in his room sometimes. And it wasn't just like casual conversation whispering, it was dark, it was evil, it was fearful. And every time he would go and look, they would stop. There was nobody and nothing there. And so soon he had to start switching the position in which he slept in to face the room so those things would not happen. Years have passed now and Cameron is now a grown man who goes to church and has given his life to God. And the whole possession episodes that he would have and encounters with this dark entity eventually dwindled away more and more. And I'm happy to update that as of 2023, Cameron no longer deals with these issues and has one word of advice, to never fool around with a Ouija board. 
Our third and final story takes place in Germany near the border of Belgium. Miguel's story actually takes place within the National Park of Eiffel. While it is littered with rivers and waterways and thick woods, there is a lot of roadways and trails, so the majority of it is covered and you could traverse through most of it. But there is still some uncharted regions where people don't really go through. As of recently, Miguel had been really getting into the whole concept of going out in the wilderness and bushcrafting, as he calls it with his three close friends. They had been practicing, spending nights out in the woods, learning about the flora and fauna, studying the animals in and of the area. I think they had gotten bitten by the survival bug. On the 2nd of September, 2022, him and a couple friends were looking for a new spot to go explore and camp at. The spot in question is a lake where both sides are actually closed off to the general public and you're not allowed to leave the trail at all. However, there are small sections and one in particular was probably about three to five miles in length in total that wasn't accessible through pathways or roadways. But it also wasn't protected or off limits. So Miguel and his friends wanting to venture off further, they decided to go off trail for about two or so hours and just explore around the lake as best they could, thinking that they could actually camp out here. Within a couple of hours time, they actually found a really nice little spot that was right by the lake. And this little spot is roughly in American terms, probably about 60 or so feet away from the water. Now behind them by about another 30 to 40 feet is the woods and they're kind of in a small little clearing. So while this is more isolated, this isn't exactly thick wilderness. I mean, they're kind of out in the open. So the boys quickly began setting up camp. Now, one quick thing to note is that it's illegal to tent camp. So their makeshift campsite was just crude and made with tarps. But it would be fine for these boys because they would get the job done and they were more than excited to spend a night out here exploring and just seeing what's around the lake. Little did they know what they were about to experience. So now it's getting darker, the night's creeping on in, they had all just had dinner together, and now it's getting a little chilly. So it's now about 9 p.m. And this is when they decide to climb into their sleeping bags to keep warm. And so they just continue on with their conversation. You know, deep talks, girls, the world, funny stories, jokes, etc. Whatever it is that teenage boys laugh, joke, and talk about. Now, one of Miguel's friends, Dave, actually fell asleep first. And out of all the friends, he is a very heavy sleeper. He does not like to be awakened for any reason. So he's out, he's snoring, and now it's just Miguel and his other friend, Peter and they're just staying up just having a casual conversation and now it kind of gets a little later we're getting to about 1 1 30 in the morning when both Peter and Miguel hear a sound not too far away from their tent that freaks them both out the way Miguel describes it as if if you've ever heard a tree fall in the forest whew, bah, creates this huge heavy crashing sound right well the sound that Miguel described hearing was a crashing sound similar to a tree, but the problem is that when a tree falls, you can hear branches breaking and, and foliage clearly being disturbed and obviously the loud thud of the tree falling. Well, it had some of those things. He could clearly hear something heavy falling and smacking and causing the ground to thud, but after that it was silent, there was nothing. Not to mention the forest and everything around them had been completely and eerily silent up until this point. Now, once that sound had happened, both Peter and Miguel are like, what was that? Both Peter and Miguel were kind of unsettled and disturbed by this loud set of noise. And they're sitting there just intently listening. And they're noticing how quiet everything is, how there's not a single sound. And it's starting to feel very unnerving. At this point, they're both freaked out, but neither of them really feel like getting up out of their sleeping bags and going to investigate the source of the noise. They had managed to lull themselves into a sleep when around 3.30 in the morning, the same thing happens. They both hear a loud boom. And keep in mind that at this point, Dave, the heavy sleeper, he's not only been asleep, but he's still asleep. And now Peter and Miguel are both awake again thinking, okay, this is the second time, what is going on? And Miguel realized that they weren't imagining this. They could actually feel the vibration of the impact, whatever it was, through his sleeping bag and his mattress. And of course, Peter and Miguel are freaking out. 
but it's dark out. They don't really have much. They don't want to get up out of their sleeping bags and leave to go see what this was. They knew at this point there really was no sleeping. They decided that they were just going to talk and wait for the sun to come up because that was the only chance of surviving or so they thought. Now, 30 minutes goes by and we're at about four o'clock in the morning. Now, this is where they all hear something very strange and unexplainable directly in front of their tent. The noises they had heard previously were in the woods behind their tent. So now directly in front of their tent, they all hear what they describe as rocks being tossed into the water and a loud, distorted, slurping kind of noise, like an animal is drinking from the lake. But the thing is, they're about 60 feet, give or take, from the water. So something was down there messing around, making loud noises, and it had to have been loud enough that from 60 feet away, you can hear a slurping sound. And apparently it was so loud that it had actually woke Dave up out of his sleep. And so all three had heard the noises and the rock skipping. None of them knew what it was. They're all freaked out, not sure what to think about this. And now all these thoughts are racing through their three minds because whatever was causing these noises had to clearly go around their campsite to get to the water because of how the land is where the forest and the lake are. And that thought alone really creeped them out because they had heard nothing, no footsteps, no branches or twigs or leaves crunching or cracking at all. Something was moving and it was completely silent in doing so. Now, even though all three boys were very uneasy, they decided, hey, let's get out of our sleeping bags. And let's go investigate, right? Because now is a better time than ever. And they didn't really have white flashlights on them. And what I mean by white flashlights, I mean light that emits that's white. And the reason why is because it's kind of illegal to be back here or so they imagined. So they were trying to be shy and kind of hide away. So they only had lights that emitted a red light, which was a lot less visible. So they're kind of outside their tent. They're looking around. They're not really finding anything. It's still pitch black outside. It is deathly silent. Their nerves are skyrocketed because not only are they trying to search around for the source of this mysterious noise undetected, but they're also afraid they're going to get mauled and attacked by someone or something out here. Not to mention that they don't know what this is. And after a while of searching and finding nothing, all three boys just kind of shrug their shoulders and head back to the makeshift tent and go back to sleep. Now, the next morning, once daylight has broken and they get up, no one is able to accurately explain away the previous night. They kind of just shrug their shoulders and think, hey, it was probably just some animal drinking from the lake and the noises we heard were probably just trees falling. But Miguel is adamant that he has heard trees falling in the forest multiple times. And with it, you have a host of all these other noises. As I stated, trees breaking, foliage moving. I mean, it's a loud process. It's not just something that falls in ka-chunk, done. Something had clearly fallen that was very heavy and hit the ground. Who or what was responsible, he doesn't know. So they leave this place and they come back a second time where an identical situation happens. They make camp and they hear the same thudding a second time, but it only occurs once. And that was the end of that time. They come back a third time, nothing happens. So as Miguel reflects back on this experience, he's aware that it probably wasn't ghosts or cryptids or anything too far out there but does explain that the experience was incredibly creepy and eerie and still has no way to explain the loud, mysterious thuds that had taken place over the night. Oh, also, while they had looked the following day, there were no signs or any evidence at all that anything heavy had fallen, no trees, nothing. And from the sounds of it, Miguel described that the sounds they had all heard, the heavy thudding and falling sounds, had only taken place about maybe 20 or so feet away from their tent. Now, if a tree fell that close, you would definitely know and there would be visible evidence. So when there's not, how do you explain that? Especially when multiple people all heard it. He still has no reasonable explanation for what happened. And if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button. And if you want to submit your own user stories, be sure to go ahead and submit them to stories at whatlurksbeneath.com. It is right here on the video. You can find the email down below in the description. Keep a lookout for more content just like this. And as always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you guys in the next episode.